thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak here today. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of a way that we can rethink the way, well, we think about food. When you look at where we are today, we have a world that's already exhausted in feeding 7 billion people. Now, going forward, we've got to add another 2 billion to that. To do that, we have to increase the amount of food that everyone's eating, because that's the trend line that we're seeing. We're going to increase the amount of animal feed. We're going to increase the amount of fuel that each person is consuming, which of course is becoming more dependent on agricultural land. And we have to do all of this over the next handful of years at the same time without getting any more water than we've had on this earth since the, since the beginning of time. Um, and we have to do it without hopefully wrecking our environment any more than, we ha than we've started out. So we've got a little bit of a challenge here today. The solution we use today is, is what we call agriculture. Now agriculture today um, basically takes up 75%, uses up 75% of all of our fresh water, consumes about 40% of all land, not just arable land, all land in the world, emits more greenhouse gases than the entirety of the transportation sector, yet at the same time leaves one billion people chronically undernourished and another two billion people suffering from regular malnutrition. Uh, and on top of that, the nutrition system that we have today takes the people that we consider well-nourished, i.e. us Americans, and gives us a set of nutrients that drives most of the morbidity and the mortality we know today. Think nutrients in our food, like cholesterol, like fat, like high fructose corn syrup. I challenge most of you to look at most of the things that people eat on a regular basis and find something that doesn't have that. And those are the drivers of obesity, of diabetes, of cancer, and of heart disease. So we look at the system and we say, well, it's working, but at the end of the day, it's actually already a broken system and it's going to be stressed to an incredible degree going forward. So we ask the question of, well, is there, is there actually something that we can do here? So the first question is, as Astro was laying out, that we started to ask is, how do we actually think about food? Well, food as we, as we know it today does two things. One is it provides the fundamental nutrition that we need to live. It provides proteins, it provides fats, sugars, vitamins, minerals. But it also is something that's, that provides pleasure and is tied in inextricably with our social fabric. We think about it as something that we, we actually enjoy. And so the first instinct that people have when you say we want to rethink uh, nutrition is, well, I don't want to give up my Big Mac. I don't want to give up my porterhouse steak. But the question is really what would happen if we actually separated out our nutrition from food so that we all went through the day knowing as of, day, as of the first moment that our nutrition was taken care of and we could enjoy food for the purpose of enjoyment, for the purpose of our social fabric. Not for the purpose of getting rid of it, but now changing the utility and not trying to combine all of that into, into one approach. So what I'm going to tell you a little about is, a, is an approach that Nubar and I have been working on, uh, an approach we call Nutriculture, that's, uh, that's attempting to do uh, basically just that. So what, what Nutriculture is, is something that combines cutting edge protein science, the world's first truly molecular understanding of nutrition and ultra low cost, ultra sustainable production systems. So ultimately what we're doing is, is giving the world the ability to produce nutrients for the first time in a way that's entirely independent of arable land, independent of fresh water, that minimizes greenhouse gases and is able to produce nutrients at less than a tenth of the minimum cost that we see today, do it predictably, do it sustainably, and tailor the nutrients that we actually produce to the actual needs of people. Now, of course, our system is, that we use today is agriculture. Um, what, we've, what we've started out by doing is basically looking at agriculture, looking at it, what, what, it does, what it does well, take the things that it does well, streamline them, optimize them, and systematically improve them. The good thing is, Agriculture has given us a ton of headway. Since the beginning of agriculture about 10,000 years ago, we've improved net field level productivity only about, uh, only about six fold or so. And when you think about it, it's sort of logical. A cow is not the most efficient transducer of solar energy into protein nutrition. So what we said is when we look at this, well, let's start from the beginning. What we did is we took 
single cell photosynthetic organisms, we asked the question, can we find something that has the right features, the ability to live in salt water, the ability to have a robustness for a process which I'll come back to, the ability to withstand the right sorts of thermal tolerances to be able to uh, be productive outside, uh, and the ability to produce at very, very high qualities. So we screened several thousand organisms that exist on Earth. Uh, it turns out there's a very small number of them that have all the qualities that we want. And it turns out, unfortunately, that uh, no one was really working on them, so we don't get the tools given to us. Um, and what we've done is taken these, taken these organisms and given them the ability to directly take in sunlight, CO2, non-fresh water, and one other thing, depending on what we're making, and directly secrete out a pure nutrient. So ultimately, you can think of this as something that acts as a catalyst to take minimal ingredients and produce the pure nutrition that we ultimately need. Now the way we do this, we take the cells that we've started out, we look at them in a detailed metabolic and biochemical way, and basically figure out how we can take out all the regular, regulatory constraints, allow the cells to be driven as fast as they possibly can, and give them the capability to secrete the specific nutrient and only that nutrient that we want. So in this way, what we ultimately do is we create a continuous process as opposed to the expensive batch processes that, that hamper a lot of industrial processes. We start our separations process and then we can reduce the traditional highest cost barrier to being able to produce anything industrial, which is the separations, and get a pure product at the end. The other component that goes into this is the system in which we actually produce this. So after you get the cell that's a very high producing cell, um, you need to grow it in something where it's a uh, transparent system that'll, that, that's closed off so you don't get evaporation, that allows the CO2 which comes in in gas form to come into the liquid form in, a, in as efficient way as possible, which involves some form of mixing. The cells, it turns out, and this is the same with plants, don't want constant light. They want light coming in at about one-tenth of a second bright light and then 0.9 seconds dark light. Don't ask why they were designed that way, but that's the way that, uh, that they actually turn to work out the best. Um, and on top of that, you need to be able to engage all of the mixing that's needed for that. You need to off-gas your oxygen. You need a material that doesn't interact with the cells or the product. Um, put all that together, and we need to also do that with just about no energy. And once we solve that, hey, it's, it's easy. But we've been working on that for, for a little while, and we've, been, we've developed a pilot system that we've had the opportunity of running in Texas. Uh, we've learned a lot along the way. We now have our sixth generation system that we're testing and validating in our lab. And the ultimate potential when you put all of this together is a system that can produce pure nutrients at up to 220,000 pounds per acre per year. This compares to what is currently the global record for agriculture. This is not the average, this is the record of 3,600. We can do it at less than 20 cents a pound, and we can do it again with no dependency on arable land or fresh water. What does this mean as we think about global nutrition? Well, if we wanted to take this system and provide baseline protein nutrition for every single one of those chronically undernourished people, it would take the land area of about 250 square miles. Um, that's about 160,000 acres or smaller than some of the ranches in Texas today. If you wanted to provide complete protein nutrition to every single person in the world, it would take the land area the size of Rhode Island. Um, if you ask a lot of people, they might say that's a better way of using Rhode Island, but I'm not going to get into that part of the discussion. So then the question is, well, what do you make out of this? And we started asking the question of just saying, well, what's the best stuff that we know of today? It's things like whey, things like ovalbumin. And when we started looking at this, we said, okay, well, that's good, but why, why is the stuff that we know today, why does that actually have to be the best? And you know, realized, and this is actually inspired by a number of conversations that we had, that there may be better stuff in there. So what we did is we looked at, we looked at food. Basically, everything that humans eat on a regular basis computationally deconvoluted every ingredient that exists there and, have, and run it through in silico assays basically to look at the nutritional value and the physiochemical values under, against a whole series of metrics depending on what we're trying to do and ultimately are, are able to select out from food things that actually have true high-end performance. So ultimately what this does is it allows us to produce pure form, in pure form really high-end ingredients that we already eat today, but they're now given to us in a, in a 
volume that actually allows us to take advantage of that. And so the way I like to think about it is we're now for the first time really understanding what is the best stuff, from, best stuff on Earth. And unfortunately, it's not in Snapple. Um, and so we need a new way to actually think about, about producing this. We've developed a whole series of different products thus far. We have, for example, a product that gives you gold standard nutrition, but tastes just like sugar. We have a product that, uh, that tastes and feels just like fat. Uh, but it actually has none of the health consequences of fat. We have products that can actually help you add muscle. We have products that can actually um, curb one's appetite in a good way. And when, when you think about what, what the opportunities are, it, it's really starting to ask the question of what is it that we actually want out of nutrition and how can we actually make the products that ultimately get us there. So this is, a, of course, a system that's, that's meant to try to recognize that perhaps our food was not optimally designed for us. After all, a cow was not evolved for the specific purpose of feeding us, nor was a soybean evolved for making a delicious milkshake. And so that as we can think of, rethink things like nutrition, there may be bigger opportunities out there. Now, we look at this and say, well, on the off chance that we might just be half right, this is going to at least put us down a path where we can start rethinking the possibility of nutrition. But we hope at a minimum, by starting this rethink, we can at least engage others in a dialogue and frankly, in the science and the technology development, uh, to think about how we can enhance our, our fundamental nutritional needs for the world going forward. Because frankly, we're at a point where our leash is running short and we have to do something. Thank you. Let us define X. X is a solution, a solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem, like climate change or cancer one that affects the world. But what if we redefine X as a challenge, an opportunity for radical thinking, a chance to light up the world with breakthrough ideas and cutting edge technology, the stuff of science fiction that just might fly after all. Solving for X requires wonder and imagination and the vision to build seemingly impossible solutions to the world's biggest problems. Solve for X. Moonshot thing.